Hello everybody, Dr. Blue here. Today we are reviewing the Desolation of Mordor DLC for Shadow of War. Admittedly, very late, but hey, better late than never. As we covered most of the core components of the game in the Shadow of War review, we won't really be covering those today, but instead we will be covering what was added in this DLC, what was good about it, what was bad about it, so let's just jump into it. So, my first impressions of this DLC were good, we had an entirely different map, playing as someone new, a completely different playstyle because we were mortal and not like Talion or Eltariel. It was the last DLC that was coming out for Shadow of War, so... What did we think? Well, initially I thought it was really good, uh, it was really fun, and it was nice to play as someone new. And so moving on from that for the features section, what was good about the game, uh, we had new gadgets like the shield, the kite, and the grappling hook. And these gadgets made up very well, I think, for the fact that we were mortal. I still felt as versatile as I ever did playing as Talion. So what are my upgrades? Um, so there's these... Um, there's a permanent skill crossbow, there's a shield charge, hold X to charge forward. Oh, wow! Uh oh, there's a Karagor though. I'm out! <laughs> I love that I can do that! That's great. The shield especially was really fun to just use as just charging through hordes of Uryx and setting them on fire and knocking them down was just so enjoyable. It's more satisfying and enjoyable than most of the abilities in the main game. Oh wait, we're gonna use that shield thing. I'm gonna do that. Oh! <laughs> That's great! I love that! Mmm! Sorry, Circa. Might be. Might be. I'm sorry. But that was awesome. Bring it! Mmm! Oh, I just went through the man! Get ready! Oh, oh no, we just got him by the tip. Just the tip. Mmm! I love this shield. It's so awesome. Boom! Get fucking set on fire, man. That's so awesome. I love this shield. It makes combat so much more fun to just be able to charge with the shield. It's actually much more fun than uh, Italian's combat. The missions you played were also very fun. They were unique, they were map altering, and every mission has significant impact on the game. Although the downside to this is that there were very few missions, but they were better than the Blade of Galantrial missions. That's a hell of a lot of grog. Oh my god, no! Ah. They are around, around. The ground is rumbling. Ugh. Oh god, please let me hit these barrels without getting killed. <laughs> uh, no! No, 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 no. Good thing is these things uh, don't try and kill me instantly because that would suck. That would really suck. Okay, I'm going. I'm out. See you later, bo see you later, boys. I'm out. <laughs> it's so stupid that I can do that. It's so stupid. Oh, here comes the rumbler. Whoa! He's huge! Oh, that hole is just... Too sexual. <laughs> it's a nasty hole. But it reminds me of... Ugh. Let's not talk about it. God damn. You could also assault outposts in this DLC, and it was kind of like mini fortress raids. You had to kill captains and take the siege point, and you had many human mercenaries coming in to help you once you broke stealth. As you tackled more and more of these outposts, more captains would be posted, and you get up to five captains and a victory point to take in these mini sieges. So I have multiple objectives. I can do A, which I, I don't have the Elven Vision, so I can capture the, capture the victory point, which is like a mini fortress thing. That's like a mini fortress bit, I think, which is kind of cool, like, you know, a victory point. And I can also defeat the outpost leader. So I've got multiple things I can do. Yeah, kind of. It's okay, I have my past experience. These controls may be different to me, but hey, I can do it. Oh, there's, there's people here! Are they mine? Hi, where did you come from? I didn't summon you. Where did you come from? I mean, I'll take, uh, not that I'm refusing your assistance, I will gladly accept it, but... There were also little augment slots in this DLC that acted as your runes, or gems, or gear buffs. They were interesting, and the best part was these stackable slots, so that each common rune you found could buff you just that little bit more. The Uruk Overlord you faced in this DLC was way more interactive than most of the normal ones. He'd stand out on the platform, yelling at his subjects, and you even blew his arm off to make his vendetta against you that much more real. What are they doing? Pull up. 
Come on. Oh, wow. There he is. That's the the war chief. See, I wish they would like do this regularly. Like they would come out onto the balcony and talk to your troops. They don't do that in the main game, but they do it here, um, which is pretty cool. I like that they do that here. That's that's dope. I could even I could even if I wanted to, I could go up to him and get him. But I gotta not alert the overlord. That's mission failed. It was just such an interactive experience in this DLC. I wish it was more common in the main game. There were also the mercenaries, the Uruks as humans. They had some Uruk perks, but also had some new, unique human ones. These guys were honestly so great, as they were an entirely new nemesis system to help you. There were some drawbacks, like they weren't as extensive as the Uruks in terms of betrayal, coming back from death, battle wounds, stuff like that, but they were still pretty damn cool. Um, to hire Circus men, uh, select the Vanishing Sun's Mercenary Company, press X to view available mercenaries. Uh, select a mercenary in the front row and hire him. Oh, they've got their own little uh, system here. Oh, and they're like orcs too. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. This seems cool. Okay, okay, okay. Who's this? Oh, they have their own little orc system. And actually, if you were an orc, I would hire you, because you are really good. Wow, look at this! They've got their own little... ...things as well. Oh, that's so cool! Okay, let's let's check the front row. So, Galar of the Path, Sergar the... Sergar the Blind? You don't look blind to me. Um, Suhala the Bringer, Adal of the Flowers, and Riaz Blademaster. So let's see, let's see how good these guys are. So, they also had their own badass execution animations, and there were some Uruk ones in there, but some unique to them. Wereworms were also a new creature to trap and utilize. These huge sandworms coming out of the ground when you shot their little sand hill thing, they were going to eat people, and then, of course, there's a huge one that destroys the canyon. Sandworms were a fun addition, and a good way of making orcs panic, especially seeing how brutal their executions were. Okay, wereworms are kind of cool. I guess it's a new kind of creature thing, and they have awesome executions, by the way. <laughs> Is that a thing behind the caravan? Like a Torvin thing? And then finally, the siege at the end of the DLC is really what all sieges should include. Fortresses getting damaged, humans fighting alongside you with the Uruks. Just in general, making them that much more interactive, especially online sieges, because they need the attention the most. Get them, boys. Fuck them up. I'm gonna blow up these walls. Oh shit, those siege beasts. Okay, where are these things on the walls? Let's hit this siege beast. Stop that in its tracks. There you go. Whoa! Oh shit! That blew up the top half of the fortress! In the fucking gameplay trailer, that was a feature and they didn't introduce it until now. I actually blew up the top half of a tower. That's so cool! Why didn't they have that from the beginning? That's so dope! And now for the criticism section. I gotta say, I really did enjoy this game, so I do have a fair amount of criticisms, but there aren't that many here that are huge issues. Some are just improvements that could have been made. So firstly, the DLC is run-based, so if you die once, you're done. That's not the bad part, though. They do save your progress, but the game loses some of its replayability in this run-based system. It's kind of a contradiction of sentences, I know, but I'm, I'm getting there. There is the ultimate goal of completing the run on Gravewalker difficulty to get Mithril gear, which I've done by the way, but once you've got that, that's it. There's not really a huge thing to do, there's not that much more to carry on. You collect the collectibles, get your Mithril gear, and you're done. It's not a huge thing, but it's best not to get attached to the mercenaries. And speaking of the mercenaries, as I said earlier, they did have their own animations, and that's true, but they did also have some of the same animations as the Uruks. Um, and he's also dueling an unknown captain to guess to be put into the hierarchy. They have the same animations as the orcs, unfortunately. There is the Torvin blueprint hunt, but when those were initially pointed out to me by Torvin himself, I thought, hey, they're new gadgets, but no, they're just in fact upgrades, and so unfortunately you only get three gadgets if you don't count the throwable grenades that you get, and then even then there's only four. One thing that really bugged me is you learn the backstory a little bit about Baranor and Idril, but only through the appendices. Idril unfortunately made no appearance in this DLC, even though her and Baranor did leave Gorgoroth together. It just kind of says where she went in the appendices. Kind of sucks, but hey. At least we got some background. Just two people. Oh, where did she go, actually? Uh, let's see if she went... 
Okay. Uh, rescue the master captured. Uh, so wait. Um, following the fall of Mises, uh, she engaged in guerrilla campaign within Mordor, rescuing Gondorians. Uh, Baranoid joined her and other Gondorians in the, uh, they were wanting to recover the treasures of the Great Hall. Baranoid joined her. Over time their numbers diminished. Idril and Baranoid persisted, uh, but ultimately committed to an audacious plan in which Idril would rescue the last of the captured Gondorians and lead the survivors to the hidden sanctuary of Heneth and Nun. Uh, while Baranoid would venture out to Lithlad uh, to open a new front in the war. Ah, okay, so... Idril survived, she is hiding out at Heneth Anun, or Anun, I don't know, and Baron was out here. So at least Idril is okay. She's not dead. Um, she is she is alive. She is fine. Okay. So, oh, I wanted to know that. They could have done that in story. Um, I kind of would have preferred they would. But hey, at least there's a, a, an entry there so we know that she's okay. The grappler gadget that you get was sometimes unreliable as it wouldn't prompt you to grapple up sometimes and that could land you in trouble. Right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I've gotta lose you guys a little bit. I can't afford a full-on fight with all four captains. Press it please, up you go. Sometimes, one of the criticisms I do have is that sometimes that LB command is a little unresponsive sometimes. Um, especially when you need it, <laughs> sometimes it's a bit unresponsive. But it's not—it's not—it's not terrible. It's just sometimes you have to press it a few times for it to work. Uh, one thing here that's more of a suggestion is that the weather could be added into fortress sieges to make them that much more epic. I know whenever I would battle Uryx in the rain, I'd feel a lot more badass. However, for the biggest thing that irks me about this game is that it's only two hours of gameplay long. The game was around 20 to 25 pounds, which is roughly $30 to $37. And now bearing in mind that normal games are $60, but a two hour long DLC is $30? That's pretty outrageous. You could drag it out and do all the Warchief missions and collectibles, but I'm sorry, $30 is too much. For two hours of gameplay, you should be charging much, much less. Maybe $10, $15 at a push. The DLC just kind of shows you how short it is, just from the appendices alone. But this kind of makes me think it's a short DLC, because look how many categories they have 100%ed already. I mean, all these, like, story things, but, like, just Tarkra, just two people. Oh, where did she go, actually? Granted, I had a lot of fun in those two hours, don't get me wrong, but I just cannot justify this game for that much money. As you can see here, I was pretty taken back by it. Um, right, so, I got 229,299, I gained a lot of XP, uh, Baron or the Conqueror. Um, okay. Uh, I got minimum difficulty nemesis times two, I got the runtime, which was one hour and 51 minutes of playthrough time I had. Um, wow, that, I did that in under two hours of gameplay, that was, wow. Jesus Christ, two hours of gameplay? Really? Um, the streams went on a bit longer, but that was because I mean, most of the time I'm in the pause menu, but wow. Alright, so I guess they, can, they treat that as a run-based game, and so every time you go in, you have to restart it. Um, and that was it. That was okay. There's some nice features in there that I actually really like. Um, there's a lot of new stuff that I kind of hoped they put in the main game. Um, but I mean, obviously, the main game I put 154 hours. The Blade of Galadriel was only 4 hours, and then this one was only 2 hours. So, um, that's definitely going to factor in. It was a lot of fun while it was, though. I've got to be honest, like, there's only two hours of gameplay, which kind of sucks. I mean, when The Witcher makes a DLC, there's, like, fucking 30 hours of gameplay. I mean, it's insane, but when other companies, it seems to only be two hours, which kind of sucks. But it was a very fun two hours of gameplay. It was very fun, I've got to admit. Um, let's read back through chat. Overall, I really did enjoy this DLC, and I would honestly recommend it to people if the price point was much more reasonable, seeing as that's pretty much the only major thing that sells this game short. So, for a true rating, I'd honestly give this game a 7. It would be much higher, perhaps all the way up to a 9, if there was more effort in this DLC. More playtime, and just more of it overall, but the real big thing that prevents this game from the numbers as high as a 10 is that price point. I just can't get past it. So should you buy this game? No way! If you see it super cheap on sale for like maybe $5, then go for it for sure, but anything above $10, I honestly recommend you save your cash.
Uh, that does it for this blue review. I know it was a short one, but as I said, the DLC is only two hours long. Uh, the next one will be Red Dead Redemption 2, which I'm kind of in the process of playing, but that's going to take a long time, probably. Uh, a couple of quick things before I go. Uh, our goal is to hit 500 subs by the end of the year, and we are so very close at 491. If I could just humbly ask that anyone watching, tell your friends, introduce them to my channel, and hey, maybe they'll like the content and even subscribe. I know I won't get it for Christmas, because at this point it's probably going up Christmas Eve, this video, but hey, maybe we can make it a Happy New Year gift. And also, I have one last video to go up by the end of the year. It'll be a bit of a look back at my channel, what happened with it, some of the ups and downs. And I mean, it'd be great if 500 subs could be one of the ups instead of one of the downs, you know? So, anything you can do, I'd just appreciate it. And real quick, before I forget, a uh, big thank you to Charlotte uh, on Twitter, who has designed me another thumbnail for this review. Uh, she like drew Baranor in this different art style um, to her regular chibi stuff. She does loads of art styles, she wanted me to, to add that. But uh, yeah, she designed this Baranor thumbnail for me. I think it looks excellent. It looks super realistic, despite the fact it's just like dots. It's pretty insane. Uh, so please check her out on Twitter. And uh, that's it. Anyway, that's it from me. So thanks for letting me rivals, Blue Dudes. I'll see you guys next time. I'm blue.